it was. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so look, keep going. Okay, so what I was referring to was the skill sets that are so necessary in order to build the applications that will be successful. And when we broke it down into pieces, um, we talked about the technology expertise that's necessary to complete the government forms because they are not easy at times. There is the, the detailed focus. You know, everything has to be so accurate when these applications go in because the worst thing to happen is six months later to get a letter saying that it wasn't complete. You start over again. It's, I mean, there's nothing more heartbreaking than that. And then least but not, or last but not least, is the, the capacity to write incredible stories, like to write the story of the individuals that we want to support. And... Um, some of you have had tremendous experience doing that. And it's just such a gift to have you on this team. And the other thing that Stephen and I had talked about before too, was it's really helpful we could build a team. Obviously people won't be able to always help out, but when they are, it's really nice to have a team sort of in place that can pick this up because um, there's a lot of effort goes into the training and making sure everybody's comfortable. But if you only do it once, then it's hard to keep that going on and on. So we wanted to build some capacity and we want to record it. So those folks that aren't here tonight that might want to get involved later on in the application process, they will have something to refer back to while we get them kind of on board a little bit. So tonight is our onboarding session. And I'm going to ask Stephen to, um, take over. There's going to be lots of time for questions as well, because Stephen goes through some of this. And so let's go. Thank you, Stephen, so much. Okay. And for those who I, I'm planning on posting this on a, as a, on the YouTube channel that Northern Lights has uh, for, there's a section for sort of training. So um, that's why we're recording it, if hopefully that's okay. Uh, but for those who are watching this as a video for the first time, we're uh, doing a kind of first round of training on how to write the private sponsorship applications to come to Canada. And the reason we're doing this is because they are um, tricky. They're not hard, but they're only if, if you know how to do them, they're not hard. Uh, so you need some kind of advice typically um, so that you don't have to hire an expensive lawyer or immigration consultant. Uh, so that's kind of the thinking behind them. Uh, this talk, I guess, and thanks for all for being here. And um, I was thinking, David and I were talking about this. Oh, and, and for those who don't know, the context here is the Riverdale, what's your organization called? Riverdale Refugee Community of Care, the RRCC. Right. And that's a extended group, some of whom are here, all of whom are, well, some of whom are here, of kind of people who are contributing to refugee sponsorship in, in any capacity. Um, and in this case, it's writing and helping with applications. Some people here have actually been sponsors, um, but even if you're officially a sponsor or not, there's lots of ways to help. And um, pe as people start coming, you know, even if you're not on the sponsorship form as a sponsor, uh, you know, your help is invaluable. And a lot of times teams change and evolve. So what is on the application isn't necessarily the person who's going to pitch in the most, which is why it's always really good to build kind of a bigger group and, and sort of excess capacity because it's not excess at all. It's often quite essential capacity. So that's why I'm really happy David has sort of slowly evolved this group is because um, asking sort of the same five people to carry the entire weight when some people move or they have life stuff going on, it's uh, much better to have a bigger kind of group you can turn to uh, if for whatever comes up. So whether it's showing up at the airport or, you know, who has time to take somebody to a bank account, it's always better to have more than the kind of basic five that appear on the application. So that's just a preamble. And when it comes to writing the applications, it's definitely also sort of takes a village sometimes. So my own proce process usually is, uh, I usually don't write the first round of the application uh, because there's usually somebody, it's usually actually a fellow kind of refugee out there who has a computer and has done these before. And there's certain kind of people I really depend on in various places, uh, lately Indonesia. And um, they often write the first version of the application with the refugee because they, they, they speak the language, they know how to write it. 
and uh, they kind of grind it out. And then I'll take over from there. And uh, I'll show you if I can remember how to do share screen. I'm going to show you um, the filing system that I use that allows me to, to know exactly where the application is in the process from version one to version what can be 16 at the end of it. So um, I will pause here to try to figure out how to do share screen. If anyone knows. And that little green box at the bottom, share screen. There you go. Yeah. OK. So. Hopefully I don't get some uh, crazy stuff going on in my computer while I do this. Okay, so share screen desktop looks like. Let's try that. Tell me if something's gone weird. Nope. Okay, so I don't need this window. Um, what I, so I'm gonna start kind of like, I'll start at the end. Um, this, uh, this kind of nasty looking folder you're looking at, this was a especially complex one, so don't get scared. But if, if you can see, I uh, by the time I got to the end, there was 18 version. I was on version 18. <laughs> and if you can see, I've kept note of who, like Asif, who lives actually in Canada, he wrote the first. I didn't edit. He didn't edit. I didn't edit. A guy named Leah Ket didn't edit. I didn't edit. Another edit, 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 edit. Uh, so this this is, I mean, this is an extreme version, but it's kind of typical to, to do this uh, to, until you get it right. And all these versions up until 13 are all editable, which means um, we can keep on improving the PDFs. But once we're, once we're done, 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 then the last few stages are just kind of like, breaking the file, photo, adding signatures and stuff like that, after which you can't edit. Um, at the very end of all of this, we get um, the, the, uh, this. So uh, these are the seven core PDFs, not core. These are the seven PDFs that you send to immigration when the application is ready. And um, there's the signature page, which is, page with a signature on it, IMM0008, which is generic, proof of funds, which is all the kind of how we got the money, refugee pictures, which is pretty simple stuff. It's like passport photos, schedules, which is a combination of schedule A and schedule two, and all of this will make sense later. Sponsor documents, which are, you know, the ones you guys sign and, and your passport photos and fun stuff like that. And uh, the settlement plan, very key. And then supporting documentation, which is like IDs, and then something we'd like to add, which is a long um, document that talks about the sort of political context of uh, what the person's gone through. So that is the final, final product. And uh, we'll work backwards from here. But one thing you should notice is if you look over here where my cursor is waving around, all the documents add up to 6.8 megabytes. One of the tricky headaches of, of the processing these is the uh, a single email cannot be bigger than 10 megabytes and a single attachment in that email cannot be bigger than five megabytes. So a lot of the processing at the end is to make sure the documents are both small in size, but legible. So there's a lot of compression and file manipulation so that you can send a single email of under 10 megabytes. Um, if it's, bigger than that, you have to send them in, in more than one email. So that's the kind of, this is what we aim for through this whole process uh, is these seven key documents. But for your average kind of application writer, you're really looking at three. And I'm going to skip to another application that we submitted recently, um, which is easier to digest because it's a single person. So that's this guy. And I didn't understand and, that. Sure. So fire away. No, that was my phone talking to me. <laughs> oh, that was Siri or something? It was Google. She gets upset sometimes. Oh, I'm sorry. I was all excited. I'm like, oh, we have a question. <laughs> I did not understand that. Uh, no one, only Google is honest enough to admit it, I guess. Um, so, so, so here we are with somebody else's application. 
Uh, we submitted both of these this week, uh, by the way. Here it is, same seven key documents. Signature page, generic, proof of funds, refugee picture, schedules, sponsor documents, and supporting documentation. Woo! Uh, the, the key, three key application documents that you spend lots and lots and lots of time working on typically are generic, which is uh, officially known as IMM008, Schedule A, and Schedule 2. So let me just break open each of these to explain kind of what I think is the purpose of them. I mean, who can understand the mind of immigration, but um, I'll sort of hazard a guess. So generic is very slow to open today. Generic is um, basically basic bio data. Um, so, uh, you know, a lot of this stuff will be repeated on every application you work on, like refugee outside of Canada, refugee, um, language, name, you know, where they were born, their date of birth, uh, basic sort of refugee claimant, they live in Indonesia in this case, um, current address, you know, basic stuff, email, uh, phone number. Um, this is my number. <laughs> I should hide this actually. That's somebody's number. Uh, we often put um, a sponsor's number as like the backup number, just in case the refugee's uh, number, uh, phone number, phone breaks or something. Um, and language and so on. So, and then when you validate it, which means you, you press yes, uh, this, all the information is there. It generates this crazy barcode, the purpose of which, don't ask me. Um, and then at the end, we have the signature page, which actually occurs um, as its own separate page in the final document. So that's generic. As you can tell, the purpose of it is to um, basically identify the person and, and where they are and that sort of thing. Kind of basic. Uh, obviously, you want to, uh, the, the things that people get wrong there are um, name spellings and dates of birth uh, because there's a lot of ways to spell a name. And especially if you're dealing with a foreign language a name, um, you know, there's a hundred ways to spelling Mohammed. So always go to the, their ID, uh, their uh, UNHCR ID is the typical um, sort of core ID document and spell exactly the way it's written there, even if they wouldn't spell it themselves that way. And same with the birthday, just use the birthday that's on that card, even if they weren't born on that day, which is a little bit typical. Um, you know, a lot of places don't keep great birth records or people are born at home. So just go with what's on the UNHCR ID. <laughs> and that's your, that's their name, that's their date of birth, whether it's, at, you know, true or not. So that's uh, generic. Oh, and the other things to keep an eye on there is, make sure their email address is correct. You might even wanna test it and send them an email um, because that's gonna be their main way of communicating with, um, with immigration for the first year and a half or a year. And if they get it wrong, like add an extra zero or something, it's gonna be a big problem. So test the email and uh, same with the phone number. Um, uh, at the, especially at the tail end of the, of the processing to come to Canada, uh, they, they will actually get a call saying, are you in Indonesia? Are you who you're supposed to be? And so their phone has to work. So um, test out their phone number too. Uh, so that's generic. I would say it's the easiest of the three because it's, you know, basic bio data, um, but important bio data. Schedule A in the final um, application document, Schedule A and Schedule 2 are combined into schedules, and they are the hard ones. So this is where I'm going to tell, talk about kind of the philosophy of Schedule A and Schedule 2. Um, one thing that you'll notice when you're filling out these applications is that Schedule A and Schedule 2 have a lot of the same information, but rendered differently and listed in different places. And for a while, I thought, wow, immigration is really like slow on the redundancy problem. But then I realized it's on purpose. Uh, the reason they do that is because a lot of the stuff like somebody's life story is not verifiable. There's no newspaper records or so on. So um, there's 
the redundancy is so that I think the visa officer reading the application can go from A to B, A to B, and or in this case, schedule A to schedule two, and see, are these facts consistent? Because if they're not, um, we have a problem. So in turn, when you are writing and editing these applications, you should also do that. You should toggle between the two in the places where they have um, redundant, where they repeat the same information and are like, okay, his mother's date of birth is this over here. Is it the same over here? Uh, the father died on this state over here. Did he die in this state over there? Uh, spelling of the brother's name, same. Um, and, and then there's, so I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, I am now on, oh, sorry, before I get into the redundancy thing, the bigger, um, the bigger sort of philosophy behind Schedule A and Schedule 2 is Schedule A is the person's life story um, in kind of chart form. And if I can move this. So in uh, Schedule A, you're going to see stuff like this, where personal history, you know exactly what they were doing um, in a chart form. So this is where he was at this point. This is where he was at that point. Schedule two, um, it is written in text form. Mm -hmm. So the same thing, he was there in this date and there in that date, but it's all in text, um, not chart. But if you toggle between one and the other, you'll hopefully see all the same dates. And when I'm editing these, that is something I very much do as I, I go from A to two, schedule A to schedule two. Is it the same? Is it the same? And a lot of times it's not. Um, a lot of times people forget where they were or they'll just sort of skip over something. And that is part of the editing process. Um, and, uh, so personal history has their whole life story in chart format. And then down on ad addresses, same thing, uh, where they ever lived in chart format. So th that's kind of the philosophy behind Schedule 1 and Schedule 2. Of the two, Schedule A is easier because it's a chart. Charts are easier to fill out. Uh, schedule 2 is a hell of a job. And that's where all the writers and editors in this room are so needed because uh, it's telling a person's life story uh, with just the right amount of detail, right? Like you, you don't want to like, you don't, you want to take out the emotive language. Um, but then on the other hand, you don't want to um, leave anything out and you want to explain things just enough. Like you don't want to explain like the uncle's whole election history. If, if this guy just volunteered an election. So you just want to give enough information to provide context. And boy, is it like a, uh, native English speaker challenge. Um, so a lot of the editing I do is taking something that's like the facts are there, but they're not, you know, the English isn't quite there or uh, it too much emotive language and not enough facts. And so a lot of my back and forth, back and forth with people is like, you said your father disappeared. What happened? Well, he was on the highway from Ghazni to Tagore and he was stopped and, and then I'll say, how do you know that? Well, my uncles came by on the highway later and claimed his body. So all this kind of stuff, you wanna make sure everything is like, there's no questions for the visa officer uh, reading this um, application. Uh, they have all the information they need, but not too much. Like you don't wanna uh, go on and on. And, and emotive language we tend to take out. Like you can just say your father died and you collected the body, you don't have to say, that much about how you felt about it, we can infer. This is more in the style of a police report where it's strictly the facts and everything that's in here, every claim, every uh, event um, should have a, a, a kind of a who, what, where, and when. So um, if you notice, it's like every key incident has a month and a year, month and a year, month and a year. Uh, if you can get it down to the date, even better. Um, but a lot of times you can't. So, um, so that's schedule two. And the hardest part is question one. Question one of schedule two is the refugee narrative, basically telling the person's life story and the persecution that led them to have to leave their country. And question two is the journey. 
And that's where the dates are actually very important. And a lot of times people forget what date they flew. So a lot of times we have to do some kind of forensic, like, okay, if you were here on this date and five days before that you left, let's assume that was say June 17th, 2016 in this case. So uh, fact, 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 those are the hardest. And when I'm editing an application, I'll spend like 50% of my time on schedule two, question one and two, making sure they're written properly, the facts are there, there's no mystery. Um, that's, that's a lot of the editing. And that's where somebody like you guys or some of you guys who have kind of writing, editing, communications background is absolutely key um, because it takes, it's, it's, it's not an easy skill. Like this is, these are sort of university level <laughs> communication skills, to be honest. Um, and so help is needed. And, and so even though there might be somebody who can write the sort of first version of the application, we need people like you who can kind of take it to the finish line, to be honest. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I, I'm sort of going to stop soon because I know it's a lot of a data dump. Um, but the one thing I wanted to get back to was the redundancy thing. So on schedule two, for example, um, we have a person's name, name written in their native language, date of birth, place of birth, um, same with the parents. Uh, we have their children, none in his case, brothers and sisters, fact, fact, fact. So we, there it is all on schedule two. Well, let's look over here on schedule A and see his father's name, date of birth, place of birth, mother's name, date of birth, place of birth. So um, there's that redundancy I was talking about. And there's little funny similar things like this same sentence here saying when he got his uh, refugee status appears twice on schedule two, like verbatim. Um, and uh, let's find it. There it is again, 7A, same sentence. There it is again, uh, 6C, same sentence. So um, yeah, so that's kind of helpful when it comes to uh, proofreading these things. And the main kind of proofreading is, like I say, to make sure that what is written in the life story, the text version of life story, especially all the dates, is the same that's written on schedule A in chart format, in personal history, and addresses. And you will be going back and forth, back and forth, making sure that those are the same. So that's kind of as much as I'll go for now at risk of uh, overwhelming everybody. So why don't we just take a breather? <laughs> and am I... Do, do, should we throw it out to questions, David? I'll let you. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, why don't you just, if you have a question of Stephen, let's just throw them out. Um, uh, well, I have a question, uh, Deborah. Here, are there is there a certain number of words? Because I notice it it all fits right up to the last line, and also it's written in the first person. So, how much is really, um, you know, what would be expected to be their voice, their knowledge of English, uh, you know, their ability to convey their story in a way that's, um, uh, you know, really comprehensible versus, you know, as you say, people with university education taking their story and you know, kind of polishing it. Um, so what's the mix there? The, in terms of the, um, the length, uh, schedule two, question one and two, which is that long narrative, it used to be a fixed box. And boy, was that a headache, like I'm talking five years ago, uh, because then you would have to do the addendum in a Word doc and it was uh, just, just extra fussy work, totally unnecessary. So fortunately they built the PDFs to expand for the on schedule two for those text boxes, they kind of expand collapse to fit the text length. So there is no text length, um, though it's good not to go too long or too short, just sort of just exactly the amount of information required. In terms of the, um, the voice, uh, the, this application is written in first person, but it's almost like there is no original voice in it, to be honest, um, because who has the level of English to you know, be able to do this? Uh, it, it's very rare that somebody has such an amazing impeccable command of English that they could write it in 
their own voice and it sort of fit the standards required by immigration. So I wouldn't worry about voice at all. I think immigration understands that these are very rarely written by the uh, people themselves in their entirety. And there is a, um, uh, on one of these forms is a question, did you get help? I think that's schedule A. Um, or maybe it's generic. Uh, sort of, did, did somebody help you with this application? No, it's, it's on one of these, I swear. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, so you say, yeah, I such and such helped me with this application. There it is. Uh, did you receive assistance in completing the application form? Yes. And so that explains it. <laughs> Once they read that, they're like, okay, now I understand why Cambridge is like this. Okay. Uh, student, does the candidate always do the first draft? Uh, almost never because um, they don't have computers or whatever, like they don't, these are very hard to do if you've never done one before. So um, in all the applications I've been working on the last two years or so, there's somebody in their home country or, or, or could be in Canada, but somebody knows them who has a computer and good enough and has done an application before. And that person writes it either with them at their side or sort of long distance. Yeah. Should rephrase this. So the, the sponsorship team doesn't write it. And the reason that I'm, I'm asking is as, so this is my first time going through this. Um, you and David asked me to write the bio about OMIT. And it, it looks to me as if that bio plugs into the form that you just went over. Yeah, it definitely uh, does. I'm yeah. sure you've seen lots of bios. You probably don't remember what I'm talking about, but <laughs> it sort of covers no, all of that. So it, I, it does. I, well, you know what? It, it's funny you say that because if you go to, I, I, I wrote up a guide on how to write an application and the classic, the best practice that I've used forever and ever is exactly what you just said, which is um, to write the bio first as a word doc and we call it the narrative and so writing the application version one the narrative and it's exactly what you just said um the only and he, you know here's the narrative here's another narrative and the reason why um i've recommended that for years and years as the first thing to do is for one thing it's a lot easier to edit a word doc versus a pdf like the pdfs are you know, they're not built for editing, um, particularly. And, and the other thing is, um, uh, a lot of times people don't have a friend with a computer and who can open PDFs. Um, like even I'd say about 70% of Canadians have trouble opening these immigration PDFs. <laughs> uh, you know, like how many times, we actually did a video on how to, how to open the PDFs. Like that's how bad it is. Um, my, my friend Heather Hedges did a video of like how to open PDFs. There it is. This video <laughs> is about how to open PDFs. Uh, so it's, it's not easy now, but um, as we have d done more and more applications for Hazara guys in Indonesia, this is why we have started to go straight to the PDF because over time we have built a little network of people in Indonesia who have done these before and can go, they can go straight to the PDF. Unfortunately, um, we don't have that luxury every time because like Omid, for example, I don't think he knew any of those guys. Uh, he, so he wouldn't necessarily be comfortable in just like spilling his guts to them. Um, or he might have been like in a different city, so it's hard to arrange a meeting because a lot of this is done in person. So when we don't have the luxury of having one of our go-to kind of refugee application writers, then we have to go to the more traditional route, which is writing uh, the narrative as a, as a separate document. Um, aside from technical limitations, the other reason for writing the narrative first is there's a lot of kind of emotional challenges in getting somebody to talk about the worst times of their lives in great factual detail. And uh, it's certainly not a one, one go thing. Um, a lot of times, like I, I, I talk about in this, in this um, guide that it's like you're really ripping off a Band-Aid and especially with trauma, a lot of times you have to give people breathing space. So you say, okay, you know, you get 
the version of the story that's comfortable for them to tell, uh, but they've omitted a lot of facts because either it's um, uncomfortable or they can't remember it was years ago. And then you have to go back at it and it's like ripping the bandaid off again and again. And it's um, very painful and you don't want to sort of push someone way past their comfort zone. So a lot of times you're like, okay, we got that much. Let's go at it again tomorrow or whenever you're comfortable. And um, that's when you definitely are not going to start with a PDF. Like the PDF feels scary, feels like a government form because it is. So put it, doing it somewhere else outside the form where it's a little easier to edit and kind of go back and go back is definitely the best route. And you can collect it all and just kind of copy and paste it as needed. Yeah. So that's a great thing is when it's done, it, 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 it very much you know, paste into the final, into the PDF and off you go. And um, there's something else that I, that I think you are good at Heather and, and probably some other people in this group is I, I talk about it in this, how to write the narrative is you have to combine like the kind of mind for facts of a lawyer with the kind of em empath qualities of, I don't know, a mother or friend or something. And you have to do both. So you have to know when you're pushing somebody too hard, but then you have to get those facts <laughs> without overwhelming them emotionally. So it's not just a purely technical uh, writing exercise. It, it, it has a bit of uh, finesse involved and um, you wouldn't want to leave it with like a, a lawyer, for example, or, or an immigration <laughs> consultant. Uh, that's that I <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you would. <laughs> but no. um, maybe you'll find a lawyer with a heart. <laughs> <laughs> My sister's a lawyer, I'll, no. I'll retract that for her sake. Uh, but yeah, like if you wouldn't want to leave this with a hired gun, uh, you want somebody who's at least slightly uh, got an emotional stake in, in the process. I'm sure this is in covered in your document here, but is it is it do you find it's most effective to do it by email or in person, like on uh, via a, a call like this? And is, are there people that are available to sort of interpret and clarify on the refugee end yeah. or not? Yeah, it, it's usually uh, like, depending on who you're talking to, it, it might be a lot to ask to do somebody to do this by email. Like a lot of these guys, 80% of them are on phones, right? They have phones, they don't have computers. Uh, right. And, um, you know, writing a, 700 by word bio on a phone is not the easiest thing so it's often um if if you're not able to be with them physically present uh it's often long call zoom calls one thing there's a, a group called capital rainbow in ottawa and um they are kind of an offshoot of rainbow refugee and they they are largely uh it's largely law students from carleton university i think and uh, there's a woman named Lisa Hebert, um who sort of told me their process. And I think they are the platinum version of this process. She, the, what Lisa Hebert told me is they have, uh, I think, three people on every call. They have a, an empath, <laughs> that's right. literally the name, uh, who I guess asks the questions. And then they have a note taker. And then they have somebody else, uh, I guess, a law student or something to make sure the facts are there. So that is, and, and they have like three hour long calls at a time. Um, no, not trying to do it all at once for the reasons I just set, explained, but um, you know, going at it until it's, it's great. And I think that obviously that's, we don't all have teams of uh, volunteer law students at our fingertips, but I think that's kind of um, what's needed. Long phone calls, lots of note taking, um, and then, you know, some empathy thrown in the mix. Um, um, Stephen, oh, sorry. sorry, somebody else want to go? No, I just want to say I, the, 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 the bio that I did of Ahmed was entirely by email, so. Mm. He must have okay. resources. Did he have a friend or he just can write long emails on the phone? He had a couple of drafts that he had created um, with, the assistance of somebody else that needed to be sort of pulled apart because someone had told him that he shouldn't share detail, that nobody wanted to hear the details. <laughs> so, Great advice. <laughs> sort of 
yeah, to kind of encourage them to open up a bit. Hmm. Um, Steve, I was going to ask, and I should know this as a Canadian, but this is the private sponsorship part of refugees coming to Canada. Are these people who might qualify for the more traditional through the government way of coming to Canada and would have a lot more support and financial support if they did it that route? So how, how does that work? Yeah, so that's a good point. We have uh, we have two, like there's obviously many ways, not many, there's some basic ways a refugee can come to Canada. Uh, government assisted and private sponsorship are the two main ones. Um, government assisted to be eligible for that. Uh, the Canadian government um, has very, very precise sort of definitions of who it will take through government assisted. And um, largely it's families, like it, it's sort of like every checkbox of vulnerability has to be there. Um, so it's it's families, uh, often with a like family as in like uh, multi generational. Um, there's ov often a big medical problem crisis somewhere in the in there um, or or more. Um, and the family is often especially vulnerable because uh, they're. They have no education or language. So that, I mean, kudos to Canada. We take the most, most, most vulnerable people. And we ask the UNHCR in like refugee camps, like give us your most beat up and vulnerable who have the least amount of chance of coming to a, a new country through any other means. Um, uh, the problem with that is um, it leaves out like, so many people, right? So uh, it, it, the one of the reasons we're sponsoring a lot of people from Indonesia is they're uh, males, single males, uh, because they had to leave, you know, typically before marriage age, and um, they will never be resettled through the government assisted program. If you believe the UNHCR and the IOM, who are the ones who uh, handpick these people and propose they come to place like Canada, that it was announced in 2018 by the UNHCR. Um, at a protest of a bunch of single male Afghans. Uh, none of you have a chance of getting resettled in 20 years. You'll be re lucky if you get resettled in 20 years, right? Um, which mm -hmm. is partly explains why we have a lot of suicides of young men in, uh, in Indonesia, including uh, one this week. So mm -hmm. um, that that's kind of explains it. Um, these guys are not going to be and oh my god if, if somebody found out they were getting resettled by government assisted program I'd be like thank you I, in fact that's one thing I've been uh, when we have kind of advocacy meetings with the minister of immigration and so on one of the the top thing I always ask for is can you just send these people as government assisted refugees because that would save a hell of a lot of work, like doing them one by one by one when there's 8,000 of them in Indonesia, like just take them all. Like Canada said, oh, we want 40,000 Afghans. There's 8,000 in Indonesia. You could just take that off your list and say mission accomplished, right? Um, but th that hasn't happened and I don't think it's going to happen. So that leaves uh, so private what, sponsorship. What makes these young males in Indonesia, what is the part of their story we should be really promoting? Is it that, they're stuck there. They can never go home to Afghanistan. It's a tragic story. They're young. They can learn. They're smart. They can fit in in the society and contribute. What's the balance? Yeah, it's it's definitely both. I mean, if you're if you're in advocacy mode where you're talking to your MP and so on, um, we say both equally uh, that they're you know hungry, eager to learn. A lot of them have learned English on their own while waiting to come here and uh, have often learned other skills. A lot of them are artists. A lot of them are taking online courses like crazy. Like they're just very much bettering themselves uh, to kind of keep away despair. Uh, on the kind of dark side of why they are there, um, you'll Heather would see this and anybody who's written these applications will have seen um, a sort of similar pattern. The reason why there's a similar pattern is these guys, by and large are almost entirely all Hazara who are a minority um, in Afghanistan. And uh, it's 
and their their Shia, which is not the main religion of uh, sect of Afghanistan. And for about 150 years, if not longer, there's been a genocide and land clearing effort to try to uh, get them out, and, and whether it's through killing them or chasing them off their land. And um, what the typical thing is is uh, well, the Taliban are for the last 20 years have been the agents of this kind of genocide. Taliban are the armed presence of the Pashtuns, who are the majority um, in in uh, Afghanistan. So basically, the Taliban are the, the 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 muscle of the of the Pashtuns who are trying to get these people just clear them out of the country, whether through death or chasing them out um, to places like Indonesia. And what the Taliban will do is, on any premise at all, they they will usually kill the father, and that's true of like basically every story I've written narrative they they go after the father on the highway or they'll find a way to get into the city an excuse kill the father and then they go after the eldest male um and so all these single men in indonesia are almost always the eldest male in the family and then that kind of destroys the family and so the the mother and the children sort of make do but stay at at home uh, but the family is destroyed and then the land becomes available for pashtun herders to take over and uh that's the kind of that's the game of uh, of this genocide and that's why there's eight thousand of these young men uh in indonesia any other questions i was i was just gonna you want to stop sharing the screen so we can see everybody's face and then see if there's more questions uh stop Share. There we are. Maureen, did you have another question? I see your hand up. I wasn't sure. Oh, sorry. I'll take it down now. I, I got my chance. <laughs> Sometimes they drop down automatically, but. Um, my, my questions are more on the technical packaging at the end, but um, maybe I can hang out at the end and not. Oh spare this entire group of oh that would be helpful why don't you just throw it out here and then we'll all learn from it and we will record it that way <laughs> okay that's fine um so I, I i think where where i pick up is in the final version of the pdf once it's created um to that point i think the back and forth from what i can tell can be done using the free version of uh, Adobe Acrobat Reader, which is, you know, you can download from the Adobe website and be able to uh, open uh, the, uh, the various documents that Stephen shared. Um, I, I say the Adobe uh, program specifically because the files are encrypted by the government and no other PDF type of application will open them. But then Stephen, from what I can tell, you are uh, basically uh, stripping the encryption off the file once um, it's completed and then using uh, Photoshop to, um, to load those PDFs and to package it up to get it in the appropriate sizes that you mentioned earlier, the 10 and 5. Is that about correct, Stephen? Or? Yeah. So up until um, about six months ago, I would print out the final application document and I finally got a, a printer. And then as, as soon as I got it, because I was working from home and couldn't use my work computer uh, printer. But as soon as I did that, the same friend who talked me into buying this um, printer was and, and scanner was like, oh, by the way, you don't have to print and scan these documents. You can do it through this website, which is unlock PDF or unlock my PDF, which takes the encryption out of it. And, um, I have all those instructions. Oh, I'm not sharing screen. Maybe I should again. Yeah. Uh, let me go back and find share screen. Share. Um, if you if you go to this, uh, how to write the application, all that. Um, this is step one. If you go to step six, I think um, it talks about so it talks about the different parts oh here we go your web tools <laughs> um these are free websites that do all that kind of crazy stuff that we're talking about so you know 
splits PDFs, turns them into JPEGs, unlocks them. There's the unlock one. That, that will spare you from having to use your printer and so on and so forth. And then how to put signatures on, um, how to break the PDF, how to get it ready for the signature. So all that really fun. It seems super boring, but it's actually my favorite part of the process, to be honest, because it means you're done and all the hard work is done. And, and then it's just like playing Tetris, like you, it's entirely technical. I don't know. It's, I enjoy it. Uh, maybe you'll enjoy it too. <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, and you, you rip the application apart, you put signatures on it, you put it back together, you compress it, but you don't compress it too much. Um, you assemble it all. And boy, is that exciting because, you know, you can spend like four hours doing that stuff and then tell your sponsors and your refugee friend who's been working on this for two months, I'm done <laughs> and we're done. And it's like, ah, and boy, it's like the most satisfying thing to do all that work and then turn it into those seven documents. So if, so if you look at that Northern Lights writing the application step six, um, that has it all in excruciating detail. So there you go. But um, my, my assumption is I, I can forego most of those uh, free applications if I have Photoshop, right? Um, it'll do it all within it. Nope. Because <laughs> Photoshop natively can load a PDF, right? Okay, now you know more than me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've done this a million times for like not refugee applications, but... <laughs> Other government types of forms. Okay, I need to I need to hear how to do that because I have Photoshop and I I probably am doing this the long way. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I, 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 uh, I I have to I have to change just like I bought this printer and found out I don't need a printer. Um, every time I'm like, I this is how to do it. Somebody is like, no, 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 there's a better way. So I think we just have heard of a better way. Um, could I ask about the process? Uh, I, you mentioned two months, which stood out for me. Is that <laughs> two months of like, you know, uh, just um, compressing yeah. files or is it mm. like we just had our first contact uh, with a refugee maybe, uh, well, I guess between Christmas and New Year's. So I or just kind of wondering like what's what would be a typical you know timeline and what, what sort of you know of course we want to get going and make this happen but what could we expect? I think it depends on how many human resources you have to throw at at it. So one of the applications, the one I was showing you, um, sort of in screen sharing mode, that was sort of one month from the sponsors telling me uh, we've got this guy to submission. Might have been less than one month, which is very fast. But the reason it was fast is um, the other people involved were both motivated and knowledgeable. So if I said, I need wire transfers from every single donation made, they'd be like, yep, there it is. So they, they were like sort of like more than usually sophisticated. None of them were Canadian born. Uh, they were all Hazaras in Canada, but they've been here long enough to know. I think they had applied themselves back in the day or been involved. Um, so uh, they were really motivated and really receptive. And when I asked for something, I got it fast. And, um, and then meanwhile, they were kind of cracking the whip on me like, oh, where is it? Where is it? So between each of us pressuring each other, we got it done in under a month and uh, that can happen but uh, it's not always possible like you might wait six weeks just for somebody's police report right like oh I think I ordered it did I order it or oh I can't find my passport <laughs> like there's uh, so many reasons that uh, something can be delayed on on any end um, and often it is delayed on any end just for your information here Stephen that Deb and um, David and Louis and um, Maureen are on Salim's team. Um, so that's, they're just starting that process. And of course, um, Maureen or Heather is and Robert are on uh, Omit's team. And uh, Pierre, he's on uh, um, Maddie's team. So he goes back a little ways. Um, so, so that's the connection here to all these folks. 
Yeah. Yeah. Some, well, some also of Shannon. Right Shannon now. is too. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah. just looked at Shannon's face over there. Of course she's on this team. Yeah. So, some of the names uh, and people on this call I'm very familiar with in terms of documents. Like, boy, I know exactly how to spell your name and your address. <laughs> and I know what your signature looked like. Um, yeah. So it's nice to actually see people yeah. moving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. The other thing that we were that I had mentioned to you, just get an email today, Stephen, if it would help too. I was going to set up a, a shared drive that I can give all you access to if if, if Stephen puts is has the the forms, the applications, or at least some of the, the forms there that you can pull them out as you go through the process. That might be very helpful as well. And then if they get changed, I suppose, or updated, and then Stephen can add the newer forms if that happens. I don't know how often that happens, Stephen. Is, is that something that happens very often? Um, oh yeah, the government does uh, release new forms. Um, it, it's happened less the last year, thank God. There was a time when they were um, like updating them constantly and you constantly were dealing with like the outdated ones. Uh, but yeah, it definitely happens. I Every time I do a new application, I have to check the government website to make sure they haven't like released a slightly updated version. Okay. Yeah, and and to your point, um, when kind of teaching somebody how to write these, uh, often the guide is helpful, but very few people read it, I suspect. Um, but then, if you have a completed application, uh, you don't need a guide largely because you like, oh, okay, I see how they did it there. It's largely going to be done the same way over here on my own. So um, so a completed application with all the signatures in, but then also a version that's editable so that you can steal you know, the text on why the Hazars are persecuted, steal it from this one and put it in that one. Um, both, both are helpful in different ways. Now, Stephen, you sent one through, like I circulated the one that was completed, but was that the uneditable one probably, right? Yeah, if once it has a signature on it and stuff and is packaged, you can't uh, copy and paste text out of it. So you you want the editable version of that as well. Yeah, okay. would you be able to share that editable version to us? Yeah, for sure. I, I just have to um, I have to pick and choose those carefully because uh, most of those applications are those people are still in process. Like oh no, we want the completed here. ones. No, no, we want ones that have gone in. So that's. Uh, no, not not even that they've gone in, but they're not in Canada yet. So oh, there, okay. there's always just a little bit of like, no. I, I just feel a little trepidatious until no person sets foot. Um, so I'll I'll pick actually to that point, and and that's a great segue. Um, the reason we're not doing this on Thursday, which was the original uh, proposed date, is I'm going to the airport to welcome a Hazara refugee, who uh, so he's the first of all the ones. Like he is the Uber, the Uber, the, the the first, and I wrote his application with him at my side in, in Indonesia in 2018, and um, oh, it, it it was very delayed because of uh, he had a hostile what we call a hostile interview and so on and so forth, um, and it, it got back on track, and he is going to be I'm going to be, like this time on Thursday I'll be at the airport welcoming him. And uh, so I, I just mentioned that to say, number one, if anyone wants to come to the airport and live that wonderful moment, please do. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I go to anybody's airport greeting um, and I would encourage you to do the same. And uh, also because um, he, he, like all these guys know him and a lot of them were sponsored sort of, he sort of is the grandfather of a lot of these applications. Like he did it and then three people he knew did it and then they told three people and so on. So, but he's like the first. So um, one really nice thing is he has a, he's very young, but he has a bit of a kind of mentor role to a lot of guys. And also because um, he is the first, he probably, he'll be the best person to turn to when it comes to the next ones. Like if they're like, oh, what's the best phone plan for a newcomer? It's like, ask him, he just did it and uh, so on. And, and by the time the other guys come, because there will be more coming in the coming months, um, he'll be able to tell them all sorts of things, like where do you get the food that we like to eat and this and that, this and that. Uh, so he's going to be a huge help to me, I think, and to, to some of the guys that we're sponsoring. And um, 
also, uh, Reza, I, I'm seeing you there. I think you're Hazara, right? Yeah, you're muted, but um, I want to introduce uh, him to you. <laughs> because, uh, yeah. because he's the first, There's, I don't have a big bunch of people to introduce him to of his own culture. So if I could, I would love to introduce him to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, I belong to Hazara ethnicity, but I not lived, I, not, I was not born in uh, Afghanistan. I born in Pakistan. So my father fled from Afghanistan in early 70s to Pakistan. So due to the same situation as you always mentioned, those persecutions in your application, in uh, Azara refugees application. So my father fled from Afghanistan in early 70s to Pakistan. I born in Pakistan. So a small, almost half million or 600,000 people of Azara community living in Pakistan, mm -hmm. in the province of Balochistan in Quetta city. Quetta city is the capital of Balochistan province. So Azara people are still living there. So uh, in last 15 or 20 years, almost more than 2000 people, Azara people targeted in bum blast, in ransom, so in, in, in religious uh, gathering. So more than 2000 people were targeted in Quetta, in Pakistan. So I was working in a government sector. I was working in, uh, 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 in customs, custom Pakistan. Uh, it is a department where duty taxes businesses are dealt in the department. So usually my posting, sometimes it was in the uh, Pakistan-Iran border. Sometimes it was in Pakistan-Afghanistan border from Balochistan province. So it was uh, in, in 2012, 2010-2011, it was very difficult for me to travel sometimes 120 kilometer to get my job, to go on my job, sometimes 700 kilometer to Iran, Pakistan border, sometimes uh, I used to work there. So for me in 2011, it was very difficult to travel to those areas. So during traveling, I usually put glasses, dark glasses on my face as well as uh, you know, a small, uh, you, you can say something to cover my face. Mm -hmm. So in some areas, it was very difficult. Many Hazara uh, people were targeted in the way going to their offices. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm one of the Hazara guy who left, who fled Pakistan to go uh, and went to Indonesia. So I lived there almost five years. I'm married, I have four children, so it was very difficult for me. So the, it was, you know, the, the surviving, you know, sometimes for your surviving, you have need to take a very big step. Now, sometimes I think that it, it was very difficult for me. Though now I'm in Canada, my children are getting their education. They are focusing their education. So this is the big aim come true for me, you know? So, yeah, this is the story that I, uh, the, the question came into my mind to ask from David and, uh, and uh, David and- Stephen. Stephen, yeah. So, <laughs> did you did you work on the application of any Hazara guy belonging to Pakistan? Yeah, I would say about one third of them. Uh, one third of them, either they were born in Pakistan or they spent like a significant part of their lives. Uh, maybe more than a third. Yes, wow. many. Yeah, uh, because of the reasons you just said. So, people often either they were born in Pakistan, where there are I think 2 million Hazaras, um, or they went there when they were young because of an attack and many, many, many. 
And I know that in the Hazara community, it's considered like Canada versus US, like Pakistan versus uh, Afghanistan Hazaras. But um, I, I think that's I think that's kind of uh, dumb, to be honest. Like I've had people say, don't tell the rest of the group that I was born in Pakistan. Um, I, I'm not, I don't think that's a, a good division. And uh, the fact that a lot of people go back and forth, like just shows how it's, it's not Hazaras or Hazaras. And the persecution, I mean, the Taliban are both in both countries. They're in both pa Pakistan and Afghanistan. Uh, there's bombings and extremist attacks on Hazaras in both places. So it's not a big divide in my mind. So uh, if you, if you want to like meet uh, the guy coming on Thursday, and if you want to introduce your kids, <laughs> I would love it. Because uh, I, I think the language and the culture is a strong point there. Yeah. It's a real point of, it's a real thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, it's okay. No problem for me to come there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a car or do you want me to get you? <laughs> uh, no, I have a car. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for sharing your story. That was very much appreciated. Thank you. And there is, um, there seems to be movement. One of our, our, our jobs, Rafat, we've had to put together his quarantine plan this week. And the other three people that should be getting theirs this week, they are very anxious to get that email. It's one of the most difficult things is that you don't know when anything is going to happen until it pops into your box and then uh, you see that it's going to move forward. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, any other questions before we let everybody go? Because we really have appreciated Stephen's time and, and we will be certainly calling on him for lots of other advice and well, support on all of this. But um, it's, been a, it's just been wonderful. Any other questions first before we we come out? Uh, Heather, Stephen, I didn't catch the name of the the guy who's coming in this week. Uh, his name is Yassine uh, Moksini on okay. Facebook. He's Yassine Bakhtiar, and okay. um, he uh, he he wrote a blog on kind of self healing and dealing with anxiety and so on. And it it was the blog that sort of brought him onto our radar and. Um, I'm just excited to have he, He's waited longer than anybody I know. Um, like it's been an extra two years of waiting. And, and like I say, I, I, I wrote the application with him in Makassar and I thought he'd be here years ago. So he's coming and I, I'm just, I can't tell you what a relief and excitement it is. And probably will actually have to stay here, uh, better or worse in my house because where I thought he was staying, there's still a family there. So. Um, that'll be cool. I hope he can cook because uh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, Stephen, that you mentioned is that there, there are some people that um, I say these teams can call upon to do that first writing, right? So when we look at young people like Salim, for example, um, yeah. uh, we might be tapping you into who who do they know out of your <laughs> network that might be able to do that first. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Some some of them uh, have that advantage and some don't. Uh, so that would be like, for example, the one Heather wrote. I don't think we had a nearby go to guy, but if they're in some of the like if they're in some of the main places where Hazar is in end up in Indonesia, um, there I can sort of name off yeah. the top of my head some of these guys. And um, yeah, and that is a huge help. Okay, great. Okay, we'll be we'll be checking that out for sure. Any other final comments? Anything else? Um, I'm so uh, looking. Mm -hmm. The newcomer is coming on t next Tuesday. No, in two days, Thursday. Okay, Thursday. So, what is the schedule? The timing? He's coming on the Turkish Airlines flight that everybody tends to come on. Um, I think it's 6.45 p.m. He's supposed to land in Canada. Uh, I usually tell them to text me when they land, and I don't even, I don't show up at the airport when they're supposed to land. I show up when they tell me that it seems like they're half an hour away from being released because there's all the lineups, and it, it anywhere from 45 minutes to five hours in terms of how long it takes them to get through. So I've told him already, like, uh, um, Get, be ready to text me when you land and tell me where you are in each of the lineups. And once he's 
probably in the immigration line. I'll probably get in the car because it's only half an hour. I don't want to pay a lot of. So if I have your number, uh, I will text you and say, okay, I think now is the best time to leave. You don't want to leave, show up so early that you're paying all that expensive parking. Yeah. Then you don't want to be late. Yeah. <laughs> sort of a um, thread the needle. Okay. So because yeah. uh, actually uh, this is my first time to go to the airport. So exactly. So anyhow, <laughs> I will ask some of my friends exact parking. <laughs> so, yeah, because yeah. airport is very confusing when you, when you enter into the airport. So it is very confusing to get the actual parking place. Yes. Yeah, it's super confusing. And um, the only reason it's okay in this case, it's because for, for me, it's okay is because a lot of people are arriving through Turkish Airlines. So I know it's Terminal 1 and I know, I know where to park. But we had a group from uh, Papua New Guinea and they arrived in Terminal 3 and I, everything got messed up. Like basically I didn't, I didn't see them. I missed them because I couldn't figure out where to park. I couldn't figure out where to go. It was a disaster. But it, I, I know very well how to deal with Terminal 1. Turkish Airlines. So I'm very happy to tell you. And if I have you, um, if I have your phone number, I can text you every step of the way. And okay. you know what? If it's confusing for you to drive, uh, I will get you. I don't have a full car. So we can go together and that will save you having to pay parking and figure out how to get to Terminal One. Um, right? Wonderful. Oh, you sure you're connected. Yeah. Okay. So, we'll, so we'll connect. Uh, but I, I, I would love if you I have a big really car. <laughs> hey, big car. Car. where do you live in in the city are you a in Lincoln. riverdale or yeah i'm i'm living in scarborough okay well i'm on your way to the airport so i don't know we'll figure it out <laughs> okay thank okay. you uh, okay so how should i get you so uh, on instagram i i have uh, send you my request yeah, yeah awesome. david you can arrange it right yeah i'll send your email i'll connect with your email and then you okay, can go okay. from there okay okay thank you okay Okay. okay, any final question, but thank you so much. Anybody else want to say anything before we say goodbye? No, just thanks. That was great. Okay. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, it was thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks okay. for taking the time and thanks for arranging, was, David. Thanks, yeah. David. Thank you okay. so much. It was very, very good. Thank you.